of product ma uh, management here at Dremio. Hey, Tom, how are you today? Hi, Lucia. How are you? I want to run a couple of housekeeping items by the audience. And the first one is I want to encourage you to ask any questions that you may have. This webinar is for you to learn about Dremio, learn about um, all the cool stuff that we have to share today. And if, uh, Tom, can you please advance to the next, the next slide? If you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and post them in the questions panel that you will see on, I believe is going to be on the right-hand side of your screen in the GoToWebinar control panel. Hit the question in there, put it in there, click send, and then we will go ahead and capture it. We will um, answer these questions at the end of the webinar in the Q&A session that we have today. Now, what are we doing today? So in the next 60 minutes or so, we are going to talk about how you can increase query performance and reduce cloud infrastructure costs, as well as how you can get a ser service-like experience in your own AWS account. And of course, we have a live demo of the new features in Dremio and at the end, Time permitting, we will go ahead and have a Q&A where we can answer your questions. With that, without further ado, I want to hand it off to Jason Nadeau. And Jason, the time is yours. Great, thanks, Lucio. And uh, great to have everybody on. Uh, really excited uh, to walk you all through the new capabilities that we are uh, bringing to market that are gonna help you do exactly what this slide says, get faster performance on your queries and really cut a ton of infrastructure cost out of the environment and do this all with a very service-like experience right in your own AWS account. Um, and as Lucia mentioned, you know, Tom is gonna, gonna show you ag exactly how all this works. Um, but first, let's kind of just kind of like cover what it is you're gonna see. So uh, Tom, next slide, please. So if you've been uh, following uh, uh, Dremio, you know that we are allowing you to um, directly query your data right in, in the cloud data lake storage that you've got. And with uh, this new edition, we call it the Dremio AWS edition, we've really optimized in a very deep way for AWS as a platform. And so if you're, you know, if you're used to Dremio already, you'll know that, hey, like you could have used us in lots of different clouds. You could certainly have used us in AWS. And in fact, we have multiple different ways uh, that, uh, that you could go and get Dremio and deploy it into an AWS environment. And with the new Dremio AWS edition, we've really streamlined this for you to make it <clears throat> a lot easier uh, to get up and running, and frankly, to um, uh, just focus on on the analytics you want to do, and not on not on, on on the infrastructure nearly as much. So we've very very uh, very much streamlined the experience, uh, and we're delivering you this production grade data lake engine. Um, for you to use, you know, on, on, all, on all sorts of things. And this is really the recommended path for AWS users. Um, now, one thing I'll, I'll say that, you know, we get this question a fair bit, hey, what about, uh, what about Azure and, you know, and Google? So to be clear, we're absolutely a multi-cloud uh, provider. And uh, in terms of optimizing specifically for the individual cloud platforms, we're starting first with AWS. So that's why you see this here now, and we'll be doing similar types of things um, uh, with the other clouds. And we're gonna now get into account what they are, but you can see, hey, very much focused on simplifying and streamlining uh, uh, for AWS and, and doing this through the AWS marketplace, which is um, you know, a, a really kind of easy way to get going. So next slide. Thank you. So this is really, this is really a big deal. Like it's free. We wanna be clear for people who've, who've had some experience with Dremo in the past, um, we have a, a, a community edition the, that is also free. So that same heritage continues on. Uh, you can go to the, 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 the Dremio um, instance in the marketplace. And again, Tom is gonna show this to you in a little, a little bit here and you can get it for free and you can use it at a, at a really a high scale. There's no uh, limit on the number of users that you can bring, the number of queries you can have. You're gonna see that you're gonna get all of the automated deployment, configuration and updates, all of our query acceleration, uh, our ecosystem integration to, you know, to bring, bring um, uh, optional data if you need to, uh, uh, and join that with your, uh, your cloud data lake storage, all production grade, community supported, free, go crazy with it. So we're very, very excited about this. You know, we've had um, just uh, all of us, right, have been you know, you know, dealing with this, this new world uh, where you know, it's much more cost constrained with COVID, um, people are looking for ways to not only save, but be more productive. 
And uh, the Dremio AWS edition for people that are in AWS is really going to help you uh, do to do all of those things. Um, and as you can see from the bottom, of course, we do have enterprise security features that are available, you know, if and when you need those things. And of course, those are available uh, for a paid subscription. All right, Tom, can uh, next slide. So let's let now let's get into kind of like what do we what do we do new and different with this edition um, if that uh, that really drives more performance and and lowers the, the the cost of your cloud infrastructure. So the first is to say well, what was the current state? Well, we know that in general people that have um, you know been doing things in the cloud, people who've been making software and services in the cloud, uh, they tend to be from a you know certainly from a query and from a processing point of view tend to be built around single exec execution clusters from an architecture point of view. So you, you can see here, you know, you've got some sort of cluster with a bunch of executors in it, various different nodes, EC2 nodes, obviously in the AWS case. And what happens is all these different workloads, uh, query workloads uh, and processing workloads are hitting those, uh, that, that same um, set of executors. And so what, what's the result of that? Uh, you get a lot of contention for resources, right? These different applications all fighting for the same uh, same resources and that has you know uh, a big impact on performance and the other uh, sort of underlying situation that uh, that exists for most of the things you know and certainly not all that uh, in terms of software and services you see in the cloud is that it's still not optimized really to take advantage of the underlying elasticity that the cloud provides and so by elasticity we mean the ability to shut things off when they're not being used you know, it's very easy to scale up and you know, or scale out and, and have more and more things running but what oftentimes happens is those things keep running even when they're not actually being uh, utilized and you know what's the result you end up paying a lot of money that you really you, you shouldn't be paying for right and it's a limitation of of the software implementations and the architectures so uh, you end up with over provisioning to handle the contention issues to, you know, to make sure that hey if there's at least enough uh, capacity if all these different workloads are hitting at once, they're essentially sizing for the peak. Um, uh, so you're over provisioning and you're overpaying. Um, but again, these these these, uh, uh, these nodes are also just running even when you're not doing useful work. And so this all combines to, to drive a lot of cost. Uh, next slide. So what are we doing? Uh, introducing a very powerful new capability that's uh, part of the, 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 the Dremio AWS edition here and that is Elastic Engines. So these are independent uh, compute engines and they're extremely resource efficient. I'll talk about it uh, here and you'll ultimately see this as well. So what does this mean? First of all, we go from a world where there's a single execution cluster on the previous slide to this world on the left where you can see there are uh, multiple tailored engines. And in fact, you can have as many of them as you want. So the idea is whatever workloads you've got, you can map them one to one, to an engine, each engine can have as many executor nodes inside as you need. This is just a simple graphics, but I mean, there could be hundreds, right? I mean, this, you can go really big depending on, on the workload, uh, or, you know, or of course, really small. And what that means is that separation, that isolation allows you to size appropriately. That's the tailored uh, aspect of this. So you eliminate the, uh, the over-provisioning and you eliminate under-provisioning. You get to actually know under, and understand your workload size each engine to fit um, and and then from there be able to track its usage right and the amount of cloud infrastructure uh, uh, cost aws cost ec2 compute cost uh, here uh, associated with each one of those things so by doing this not only are you cutting out a lot of the cost but you're also we're eliminating the contention each engine is is available and ready to work you know work with uh, and support uh, the workload that it's that it's that it's mapped to uh, and so you are getting much better performance uh, at, at a lower price point and not having to worry about, uh, you know, these workloads uh, fighting for resources. So then we take that as, as sort of a, the, the starting point, really, uh, and then layer on a bunch of automation. And in fact, well, that's, uh, if you really think of it at a high level, a lot of what we've done with the AWS edition has really had a ton of automation in different areas. And one of them is around on-demand and elastic scaling of those individual engines. So what actually happens now is that any engine, if it's not actually um, seeing query demand, and we, you know, Dremio is monitoring this, our coordinator is taking uh, uh, you know, care of this, that engine is not actually running. Only when query demand comes in, we will fire up the engine, bring it up to, um, you know, elastically scale it up to its, uh, its configured size, 
And while those, the query activity is happening, great, the engine's running. But when the activity stops, we then spin it down elastically and shut it all the way off to zero. And so in this way, you are not consuming any uh, compute infrastructure that's not being uh, used and you're not paying for it. Uh, it was a really, really powerful way to, to cut costs out. And so uh, over a traditional um, or, or call it a typical mixed workload environment, we're seeing the ability to save over 60% of your cloud infrastructure costs, uh, which is a really, really big deal. Again, by, that's the combination of eliminating the over-provisioning and scaling down. And then one of the other interesting things that happens as a result of this too, think of this as a specialized use case, is you can now take advantage of the, the linear scale inherent in Dremio uh, to really speed up long running query workloads. So you know, the, the, imagine they're running for 100 minutes and you, you know, imagine you maybe have uh, you know, a few nodes that are, that are running there to support that workload and you, you're paying for the area of the curve. Right, so you see that little orange bar runs for a long time with a small number of, uh, uh, of nodes inside that engine. But now that we are shutting things off when we're done, you could choose to flip the curve and instead say, let's spin up many more um, nodes inside the engine. So in other words, size a much bigger engine for that workload, but run it for a much smaller period of time. And you can do that because of the linear scale of Dremio. Right? Add more nodes, things complete faster, and when they complete, they stop. And so you essentially don't, you know, you're gonna pay about the same amount for your cloud infrastructure, but you're gonna complete your, your these long running queries much, much faster, right? Um, there's a certain amount of time it takes obviously to spin the engine up. So it doesn't, doesn't start, um, you know, in a split second, but uh, you know, after a minute or two, depending on how long, how many um, nodes you have uh, in that engine, you know, the, it, it's cranking along and finishes its work really fast. So a really interesting way to, to accelerate um, these long running queries. All right, next slide. And so this is a picture of you know, where that 60% stat on the previous slide comes from, right? Which is a, this is a big, big number. So you, you look on the left, you know, your EC2 cost for, for most people um, with these uh, single you know, uh, cluster you know, architectures, this shows the the, the over provisioning, right? And, and the fact that you're using this stuff, you know, and paying for it, even if you're not using it. So you would have had to size for the peak, which is basically the whole gray box. And whether or not things, you know, are, are seeing query demand, you're paying for it. So you, the whole area of that box is, is is what you would have had to pay for from an infrastructure point of view. And now with uh, the the multiple elastic engines that we have, you can see, okay, we don't do that anymore. We're only gonna um, you know, consume compute when we need it. And when you kind of just add up the area of those little chunks, you see that, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a small fraction. And in fact, depending on, on your query patterns, this could be a lot, uh, uh, a lot more saved than even, than even this. And, uh, and we definitely see uh, quite a few situations with these, these bigger queries that, uh, that would take um, uh, a lot of compute to run. And then they just, those engines, uh, you know, continue to run because they're not being shut off unless people are going, and, and really putting a lot of, of, of their own, um, you know, time and energy into trying to wrap their own automation around it. So we've done all this and it's just built right in. Okay, next slide. And so let, now let's take a look at the picture of how, you know, the, the all-in uh, infrastructure cost savings uh, come together with Dremio compared to other alternatives that, that you know, different uh, query engines that you might see. Again, these single cluster alternatives um, that, uh, that exist. And so, the top gray bar would be what the amount of compute infrastructure and thus the bill, you know, you would have paid um, to, uh, to Amazon. And uh, then we come along with Dremio. And so, you know, this is the, 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 these next two bars are before the elastic engines. So the first one is just the fact that, hey, uh, our aero-based engine is end-to-end -end columnar. It's a lot faster, about two X faster conservatively than uh, these other approaches. And what does that mean? If you can get the work done in, um, in half the time, because it's twice as fast, you could choose to keep the same performance and use half the infrastructure. Basically, you can size for smaller, smaller nodes, right? Smaller engines. Um, and that cuts your, that cuts your costs. So you know, uh, for this slide, we're gonna just assume we'll keep performance the same. And we are essentially able to convert the performance that Dremio will give you on your queries into infrastructure cost savings. So the fact that we're 2x faster on average, just from a 
you know, call it a, a, a vanilla aero-based, um, you know, engine that we kind of built it end to end around that uh, full-on architecture saves you half in terms of your infrastructure cost and your and your uh, EC2 compute to support a, a similar performance outcome. Then layer on the the acceleration technologies that that Dremio uniquely builds, uh, things like our data reflections and our columnar cloud cache, conservatively adding another 2x performance increase, which means you cut another. 50% of the cost out. So uh, already we're at like one quarter of the total cost of your, you know, your typical uh, SQL engine, you know, out uh, uh, running in, in Amazon. And then we layer on elastic engines uh, down at the bottom. And so we take the 60% that we just had from the previous slide, uh, apply that, and what do you end up with? About one tenth of the infrastructure cost of, of alternatives. So 90% lower cloud cost. We think this is a, is, a, is a big deal. The you know, customers that, that we shared this with uh, are super excited about this because they can now take that um, you know that money and put it into other strategic projects. Right? That's the that's the goal here. Right? It's we we want to help people do more with the dollars that they have and and do more analytics. You know, um, become more competitive. Put it into other various different services. Um, that's the uh, that's the goal. All right. Next slide. And so Elastic Engines is uh, a super powerful capability, but uh, but it's not the only one. And so it, you know, Elastic Engines is going to drive the performance and uh, and the cost at the same time, which is which is really fascinating. But the other thing that we've done is wrap a lot of automation just around Dremio, optimized for AWS uh, to give you a service-like experience, uh, and do this actually all in your own AWS account. And I think that's that's really powerful and interesting. So. Uh, you think about this, you're going to bring your data, it's all going to be in S3, maybe some other, um, you know, uh, optional sources as well. And that's your data. You want to keep that. Uh, and now you can run Dremio and the, all the compute with EC2. That's all yours as well. But what you want is an experience that still feels like SaaS. And that, in order to do that, takes a lot of automation. And so that's the other thing that, um, that uh, we've really built into the AWS edition here. So. Uh, the way that manifests itself is through another feature or capability that we call parallel projects. And these are these are really you know independent instances that um, that contain all of their resources, so full isolation, great for compliance. Um, you know you can operate completely independently. each each project can have as many different engines as you want, all you know the stuff that we were just talking about on the earlier um, few slides here. And you know that means you know different teams can have their own thing. Uh, different business units can can operate independently, and as we'll talk about now, it's also just really easy to to operate and and use. So the first thing you know here is to say that uh, we wrapped a lot of automation around the deployment, and you know as, as Tom will show you, um, you know you can go you know, start from our, our our website, ultimately get you know through into uh, into the marketplace, and we just kind of make it easy to fire fire drum you up and get that get your first project going. Uh, and every time you start a project, you're always getting the latest features um, and the latest version. So it's easy to start and make sure you're, you know, you're you're, you're getting the, the the best capabilities that Dremio has to offer for uh, for AWS. Um, but not just features, configuration. So that's the the middle of the slide here. Uh, you know, previously, yeah, you would have had to do a, a fair bit of, of of configuration and tuning and whatnot, um, and setting Dremio up to really take full advantage of AWS and we're doing that all out of the box. So things like the column or cloud cache configured, you know, to work on uh, on S3, same thing with our data reflection infrastructure for um, accelerating um, you know the uh, the business intelligence and and um, you know dashboarding type queries, all that's all pre-configured and ready to go. So you know if and when you need to configure those those reflections, uh, you it's easy to do. And even backups, right? So to automate a backup setup uh, to make sure that uh, that you know the environment is recoverable, so things that you would sort of expect you know in a very SaaS-like experience, um, and that helps you uh, to make sure that all of your Dremio projects, and you may have a bunch of them, right? Um, they stay fast, they're reliable, super efficient, uh, you know, using the capabilities as as we've meant for them to be used. And then lastly, staying up to date and staying current on features, we've made this really easy as well. So very SaaS-like, in fact better than a lot of SaaS offerings uh, that, you know, that are out there. So in, in many ways, this is a best of both worlds situation. You get the, you know, the best parts of SaaS and you get to run in your own uh, VPC and AWS account. 
So uh, to take advantage of the latest features, you basically just stop your, you know, your instance in your project and start it again. And we will go look to see if there's another version, um, you know, uh, prompt you if you want to uh, accept it. If you do, great. And then the project uh, fires up again and is, you know, is running on, on, on all the latest bits and the, and the latest capabilities. So very easy to stay current. Um, and uh, then, you know, this is all, by the way, all this that we've talked about so far, free, right? You do all this for free. When you decide that you need some additional enterprise security features or Dremio support from, you know, our organization, you can enable the, those features with a, with a paid subscription. And it's very easy to do. You just put the key in and those features just turn on. So uh, it's all essentially the same, uh, you know, underlying instance and code base, it's just a switch. And so there's no migration, there's no, you know, upgrade process. It's very, very simple and streamlined um, uh, to, to help you move from uh, the free high scale production version to, you know, the, the broader enterprise uh, security features that it would tend to get used when you kind of really get a lot of cross departmental um, usage and you want to control like uh, role-based access and, 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 and so on. You can see some of the capabilities there. So that's, that's parallel projects and, and kind of represents the automation and the service-like experience around Dremio. Next slide. And we're, we're basically, that's the overview. So, uh, and uh, the, the way I would just sort of summarize, you know, Dremio is going to give you these lightning fast queries directly on your data lake storage, right? No, no don't have to go uh, copy move data around anymore to, you know, various different, you know, data warehouses and cubes and extracts and all this other stuff. Uh, it's very resource uh, efficient and it gives you a governed uh, environment as well when, uh, you know, when, when you need that. So much faster, you know, query speeds uh, compared to uh, you know, SQL uh, engine alternatives that are out there and much, much lower uh, cost uh, and risk, frankly, you know, you know, you don't have to worry about your data getting locked in, losing control and having a bunch of these, these copies of data floating around because you're actually accessing and querying your data right where it lives um, in S3. So that's the, uh, that's the overview with that. Uh, next slide, and we will head over to Tom for a demo. All right, well, thanks a lot for that, Jason. Um, you know, we're really excited to be able to launch this uh, new offering for Dremio. And what we wanted to do today was to show you uh, an actual live demo of the AWS launch process. Uh, so you can see just how easy it is uh, to use and how accessible it is. Uh, you know, the current process, you know, is, is typical with enterprise, so you know, enterprise software is have to stand up servers and install the software, et cetera. Uh, and a, a lot of what we've done with this is really enable people to stand up and run Dremio with very much of a, a click through experience uh, in just minutes. And so that's what we're gonna take a look at. Uh, so starting off, uh, to, uh, what we're seeing here is the AWS Marketplace uh, uh, pages, where you can look at all the different offerings that are there. We currently have Dremio listed within AWS uh, and it is something that is easy to find uh, and then sign up and, and go through the subscription process. Uh, what you can see here is uh, the free version of Dremio that we offer. We offer an overview, uh, some of the different pricing. You can see here, as Jason was highlighting, uh, that the free offering is fully free uh, from a software perspective, usage instructions, et cetera. Uh, something to highlight is right now, if you're to go to AWS and try this out, we have our 4.2 version uh, currently published that uses an AMI-based uh, launch process. Uh, we're just a week or so away from launching a new cloud formation template uh, process, which is uh, more streamlined and, uh, than the existing and has a, a few modifications to it. So that's what we're going to walk through today. So if you're just uh, a quick uh, realization that if you're going to AWS and launch today, it, it's more of an AMI process. Uh, uh, but in a couple of weeks, we're going to be offering a cloud formation process. And that's what we're going to take a look at uh, right now. Um, so what we're going to take a, a walk through is uh, once you go through the CFT, subscribe to the offering and, and start to uh, create an instance, uh, you'd basically see this page, which would be to create a stack. And uh, an AWS stack uh, is a, a, a description of a variety of objects to create. Um, and we define inside there all the objects that need to be created uh, for essentially a new version of Dremio. Uh, the basic parameters that need to be entered are just the name. So we'll go AWS e webinar. Uh, the, you can configure the size of the coordinator node, uh, specify your key pairs, which VPC, 
which subnet uh, you want to run in. AWS requires people to be able to enter uh, which IP range do they want to expose publicly. And uh, from there, that's basically it. Um, there are something else to highlight is there are some advanced options, which if you just want the click through experience, you don't have to configure. Uh, part of the CloudFormation template stack will create IAM roles and security groups for Dremio. If your organization has uh, you know, certain security requirements where these types of objects have to be created ahead of time before launching a marketplace instance, you can do so. We have documentation on what needs to be created and you can just enter those profiles here. Uh, but for most people you know, working in, in normal environments, you could basically this is all the information that needs to be entered. Uh, from there, it's very much of a, a click-through experience. Uh, and then all you have to do is accept within AWS and create the stack. At this point, what you'd see here is a variety of events and resources that would be developed. Um, and the output to the AWS stack, and this is all very standard for the AWS environments, would be the web links for the new Dremio environment that you just launched. Uh, this process take, typically takes about a minute. You can see already there are several different things created. Uh, I'm just going to hop over to a pre-created one uh, just so that we don't have to wait a minute. Uh, once all of the resources are created, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. once all the resources are created, um, basically you go to the outputs phase and you can see here two endpoints that are published. Uh, one is a private endpoint that is only accessible within the VPC uh, of your AWS environment. And the other is the public endpoint. Um, in a future version, we're also going to make this configurable as well, uh, where you don't have to create a public endpoint and, and you can decide whether or not to create one. What you also see here is embedded inside the URL is the instance ID. This is actually a security recommended security practice by AWS to make sure that other people can't go and make unauthorized use of a new instance before you've con configured it. Uh, this is a new environment that just got, got stood up. Um, and so because of that, anybody could access the uh, IP before you've configured it. Uh, this requires you to understand what the instance ID is from a security perspective, and it's AWS's recommended practice. And so for simplicity, we actually embed that in the URL for you. And so all you have to do is click through. Um, and what you will see here in just a second uh, is basically the authentication page. Uh, so you can see here is already the instance ID is populated. We just authenticate, uh, and then we can go to create our projects. Now, in this page, there are two options. Uh, one is to create a new project, and the other is to open a existing project that was previously closed. The way to think about Dremio, and we'll have some slides to, to, to ex explain this, is each project is a fully independent Dremio cluster. Uh, so if you're familiar with Dremio and use Dremio today, you know that you install a cluster that has a coordinator node and a set of execu uh, execution units and its own configuration. All of those concepts are encapsulated in, in what we call a project. Uh, and when you launch from the Dremio marketplace, you have the option to either create a project uh, or to open existing projects. You can see here we're in US West uh, availability zone uh, A. Uh, and so we can actually open any previously created projects in that. And we have a variety of, of test things within our Dremio environment. What we also do is we actually show other projects that may be open. Uh, so if you can, for example, see that there's a variety of other projects that are opened in this availability zone, and you can also look in other availability zones. Um, we have some definitions in USOSD, and, and there's some uh, other projects in Europe as well uh, that are uh, there for informational purposes. What we're going to do in, in this demo is essentially, uh, and we also, also offer a variety of other things that could be done here. For example, for previous projects that you have closed but you might want to open up, we also do automatic backup and restore. And so you can see here, it's very easy to look at your previous backups. Uh, you can click on a previous date and you'd essentially restore that project to that point in time and then open and continue it. Uh, or alternatively, you can open the existing version of it or you can even delete them if you just wanted to get rid of them, for example. Uh, but what we're gonna do is we wanna create a new Dremio environment and just kind of go through that process. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here is enter, all you really have to do is uh, enter a name Uh, you can specify the size of your engines. Uh, this is a demo, so we'll just go small. Uh, you can go very large or even custom size if you wanted to spin up uh, engines of several hundred. Uh, I believe our limit's currently 1,000. And so we offer a very broad range in terms of sizes and configuration choices. You can choose whether or not you want to enable automatic backups. If you have spec uh, security requirements for you to customize your roles, you can do that as well. Uh, we also have links to the documentation that provides 
detailed descriptions of all these uh, aspects in case you need that. Uh, and then at that point, this is basically all the definition that you need to do to create a project. Uh, and then you just click Create, and Dremio will do everything for you. Uh, some of the steps that will happen are we will create a S3 bucket where, where, where reflections and some other objects will be stored. Uh, there will be an EVS volume created uh, uh, to persist the coordinator node, uh, and also an EFS object as well where we'll uh, store logs, for example. One of the great things about persisting all these objects externally is the Dremio cluster or project doesn't contain any information in the servers. It's all persisted in the AWS environment in terms of the different infrastructure, uh, storage infrastructure aspects that AWS offers. And because of this, we're able to fully stop Dremio clusters and then restart them uh, without in, in, in the state that you just left them. And that's because you can think of a project as essentially a, a very ephemeral concept and everything's persisted uh, within AWS storage. Uh, so this process uh, in terms of creating the FES objects um, and, and, and uh, updating the node can take a couple minutes. So what we want to do is switch over to a couple slides real quick in order to show you uh, a little bit of a logical description in terms of what's happening within the AWS environment. So we'll just continue our slides here for a second. Uh, so what you're seeing here is essentially logically your AWS account. And you may have within your, within your AWS account uh, storage that you use in a couple different regions. In this example, uh, there, a, a AWS account primarily uses the US West 2 region uh, and the EU West 1 region and has S3 data located in each of those regions. What you can think about is you create projects within a specific region. Uh, so in this example, we've created two projects within Oregon and one project within Europe. Uh, projects are a configuration and a definition of reflection storage, uh, the metadata store, et cetera. And they're completely independent and isolated from each other. Uh, so in this example, there's two essentially Dremio clusters. They're available uh, in Oregon and, and one in Europe. Um, the way to think about a project when you start it is essentially the project starts by the coordinator node uh, is spun up. Uh, we essentially launch an EC2 instance. Uh, and that instance attaches to the project's objects. And so that's what you're seeing with the coordinator node, EC2 uh, instance has been spun up. And with the dotted line, it's connecting uh, to the, the project's objects uh, that are stored within your uh, environment. And that defines a Dremio cluster. And you can see here, we're actually running the coordinator node with no engines, it's just the coordinator node. And that means you can do a lot of data curation type activities uh, without actually having to do any um, uh, spin up execution resources for cost savings. So it's it's possible to do a lot of configuration and other aspects in a very cost effective manner. Uh, then for example, with this cluster, this cluster may have three different engines, uh, two of which are enabled for auto start and stop, meaning those execution units uh, will start and stop dynamically based on your workload. And one is configured to always be on, meaning it's always available for immediate usage. And we use workload management to route uh, different queries to different engines and there's full uh, configuration aspects to there. You can see each engine has multiple different uh, EC2 instances within it. Um, and when an engine starts, it starts uh, multiple EC2 instances uh, that we call them executors for that engine. Um, and then when an engine stops, uh, they're spun down. In this instance right now, Dremio is only running in one region. Um, and then after you get things running, you can configure uh, both your AWS data sources and even external data sources. You might have data in Azure, for example, or in your on-prem environment and uh, you can configure your AWS uh, version to connect to any of those. Uh, you can also independently start and stop other projects in other regions um, and, and run them only when you need to. So in this example, later we spun up in Europe uh, the project and, and it has started processing. Uh, the engines that are dynamic will start and stop based upon uh, the runtime needs of your users. And what we just showed here is if the systems are not are being utilized as much, Dremio will uh, shut down those engines and actually delete and remove and deprovision those execution units for cost savings. And so what we just saw there is uh, even though the Dremio project is still running and it's still available for users to access and utilize because all those activities are happening through the coordinator node, uh, we've actually shut down and deprovisioned those executors, which are the number one uh, cost structure uh, to Dremio, because we have one node for the coordinator services, and if you have a large Dremio environment, you might have 10 or 100 nodes for the execution plane. Uh, so in this instance, we're able to dynamically start and stop those different executors. 
uh, what I just showed here is you can dynamically start and stop projects independently of each other. So here in Europe, we decided to stop that project. It still exists. I could still I could restart it at a later point in time, but I actually closed that project, which means that I actually shut down not just the executors but the coordinator node service, and it's fully at rest. And the only cost structure is essentially the KV store and a couple other objects that we keep in storage uh, are related to the configuration, which defines the project itself. Um, and then at another point in time, we in US West uh, two in Oregon, uh, we can stop that project. And at that point, uh, the cost structure is extremely minimal because it's just a couple of small data objects that are persisting what a project is in your account. But you can go ahead and start them you know, after the weekend uh, and, and start to use them as you uh, may need. So this creates a very dynamic environment that enables you to configure the amount of resource spend to really match uh, your unique uh, uh, usage patterns, which may be very ad hoc or may be very on demand. Um, and now let's go back and take a look at where we had left off. Uh, so that was the initial project that uh, we were creating. So after the create project completes, so what we're seeing here is this is the tab that we were in before uh, where we created that new project. And it went through and it created a bunch of different objects. Uh, that are needed in order to essentially persist the state uh, of that project. And now what you're going to see is the a typical Dremio environment. So uh, what we've got to here in just a matter of minutes is a Dremio environment, fully installed, spun up, configured, and, and, and ready to go. If you were to go through the process of installing a server and then installing the Dremio software, et cetera, your first experience then would be at this uh, Dremio sign-in page. Um, and so once a project is created, it immediately transitions over to the sign-in page. So we'll just go through and accept the EULA. Uh, we will create a new account. This is all very standard if you're familiar with the normal Dremio environment. And from this point, uh, things should look fairly similar. Uh, let me just create some credentials. And at that point, we're ready to use Dremio. Uh, we have just in a matter of minutes gone through the cloud formation launch process that uh, started a, a process by which we could either create or continue existing projects. And now we're inside Dremio. Um, and we have actually uh, natively installed is some uh, S3 data sources. So for example, uh, we have some taxi data that's stored uh, within Dremio uh, and available for different querying. What I also wanted to show is uh, some new admin activity pages uh, related to engines. And so what you're seeing here is we just spun up Dremio and we have that default engine configured. Uh, if you remember when we first created the project, we specified that we wanted uh, a, a, an engine of size two nodes. And so you see here with two workers that we just created. And you can see some information about the state of, of these different executors as they start up. Uh, they were starting in, in a pending mode as we were first getting instances uh, from AWS. They're now provisioning as a software comes up and that will be complete uh, pretty soon. Going to the node activity page, uh, you can see the different nodes. Uh, you can see that this is the uh, coordinator service uh, that spun up automatically. We actually have a preview engine that runs on the same node as the coordinator. So this is the same IP address as the coordinator, and we actually have a small preview engine that's always running there. This means that you don't have to spin up engines in order to get previews of your data. You're able to curate your data uh, within our, our uh, sources and spaces without actually running any execution units, because we'll be able to make use of some compute resources in the coordinator node to essentially show previews uh, within our, our coordinator uh, services. Uh, going back to the engines, you can see that this process is very fast and the engine is up and running. And if we go back to the node activity page, you can see our default engine is up. At this point, Dremio is fully available to run and, and perform uh, any type of processing. And so we have some taxi data here. And let's just show this real quick inside Tableau. So I want to take a look at this taxi data set in Tableau. I'm going to open up Tableau and, and just perform a couple of quick operations. And then we're going to see how Dremio is supporting those operations and querying S3 data. Again, this is just in a matter of minutes. We are able to spin up a new Dremio process or new Dremio system, query S3 data uh, almost immediately. Uh, so now here, once we open up Tableau, you know, I want to look at total spend of taxis in New York by date, for example. So we're just going to take a couple quick looks at that. Uh, I actually prefer bar charts, so we'll do that real quick. And I don't want to look at things by year. I want to look at things by day. So we're performing lots of live queries against S3 through Dremio. We did this very quickly, able to just spin up. 
I also am interested in kind of uh, uh, tip spending. So, and I actually don't like those colors. So I don't know about you guys, but I like red, green diverging better in Tableau. And we don't want to look at the sum. We want to look at the average spend. These are all live queries against Dremio against S3. And this is actually very interesting. You can see here in New York, people tend to tip a lot more in the middle of the month. At the end of the month, in the very beginning of the month, uh, the average amounts of tips fall off very quickly. Uh, that, that you know, I guess that's related to people's paychecks or, or whatnot. Going back to our Dremio system, we can see that we were executing live queries against Dremio, against S3 data in just minutes from having spun up. Uh, there's a variety of aggregation queries being performed here. Uh, and then one other thing that we can do is we can go and uh, we can go back and we can say, you know what? We just wanna stop this project. So remember how before I was showing uh, that you can uh, create projects, start to run them and then shut them down fully. So I just started Dremio, I experimented, I did a few things and now I wanna fully save costs. So I'm gonna stop that project. At this point, the project is terminating, the browser is not gonna be responsive and the project is stopped. So there we go. So we can actually close that tab. Um, and now actually one thing we're gonna go, if you remember, we spun up uh, a first cloud formation template and uh, we actually went to another one that was kind of pre-started that, that we could go through. We can go back to that one. And now if we look at it, uh, we can actually see that project that we had created. Uh, we have stopped the project. I'm going to go through the same authentication steps, but you'll see here if we go down, um, uh, you can see here we have a pro we have one of the uh, CFTs that we've created and we can actually just go and delete that project. So at this point, the project is already stopped, but what I can do is I can actually just uh, fully delete that project if I want, confirm, and you can see that the objects that were created when we created the project are now gonna be fully deleted. Uh, so this is a very simple process. And, and, and what did we show here? Well, essentially we showed that we can create a project very quickly for our test purposes. We can dynamically start and stop execution units uh, based upon query workloads uh, or based upon whatever administrative uh, hooks you may want. Uh, and we're able to get a Dremio system started in just minutes and then query data uh, through BI tools like Tableau against S3. And so we're able to use Dremio to almost immediately uh, query S3 data. Then we're able to stop the project to save cost. And then we decided, you know what? We were just using that as a test sandbox. We just wanted to delete it and clean it up. And we're able to delete and, and clean out that project very quickly. Um, so hopefully that was interesting. Uh, like I mentioned, that CFT launch process will be coming out in a week or two. We have an, an AMI basis uh, currently available, um, but we're really excited to have all this out there because it drastically uh, simplifies the process of running Dremio. And so with that, we'd like to uh, kick it over uh, for questions um, and uh, we're happy to answer anything that may come up. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, that was a great demo, and, and Jason, thank you as well. While we go through the questions, I want to remind the audience that we have resources out there for you to learn more uh, about and sharpen your skill, your Dremio skills. So you can go ahead and visit the URLs that we have in there to see our materials. You can go to dremio.com slash AWS to learn more uh, detail about what we showed you here today. Also, if you want to see the step-by-step -step instructions on how to launch Dremio, AWS edition on your AWS account, go ahead and check out the launch link that we have in there. We also have um, a blog where you can see all the, all the uh, articles that we're writing about, uh, documentation if you want to continue researching and experimenting with Dremio. And of course, we have a library where you can see uh, this webinar and all the webinars that we have um, and all the material that we have created for the community. Also, if you want to see a live demo like this one, go out to dremio.com slash demos where you will be able to request a live demo and also uh, register for any of the, the weekly live demos that we do on our site and also um, tutorials and resources. We have a lot of information in there and in our site on how you can connect Dremio with any one of the um, your BI tools, your data science tools, how you can do a bunch of cool things using Dremio in your use cases. So uh, with that, Tom, Jason, um, I believe you want to address some of the questions that we got in the Q&A panel, so uh, back to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, and nice job, Tom, it was great to see. Uh, I tell you what, I've been answering a few of these as we go, so hopefully folks are able to see them in the um, in the questions panel. 
uh, but there's a few that I uh, I definitely can't handle myself, and so I'm gonna I'll just ask them for uh, for Tom. So Tom, I'll, I'll read them out for you. Um, so the first one is the mar uh, and this this comes from Daniel. Um, so uh, thank you, Daniel. The marketplace recommends an M5D two uh, X large EC2 instance. Is it possible to reduce the instance for further savings? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I, I didn't show it in terms of the interest of speed. Uh, we offer everything from MD uh, five X large uh, through eight X large for the coordinator node service. So there is just the X large version. Um, uh, smaller than that, and and uh, you know we want at least that much memory for the coordinator node services plus the preview engine. Uh, so that's the smallest one that we offer. But we offer everything from just the MD five MD five X large through the MD five eight X large. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tom. Um, and Daniel has another question as well. So his is, can we still add custom data connectors with this version? They built a custom uh, connector for uh, Monet DB. So that's a, a great question. Um, those type of things can be done by SSHing uh, into the instances and, and installing um, uh, manually and in installing some of them. What we want to do is, is look through how to simplify that process. Um, so one of the uh, further enhancements we have is how can people essentially have a, a standardized place to put into the, uh, for example, the, the, the EBS volumes that we mentioned so that those types of uh, customizations uh, can be done. Uh, the same process is actually used, for example, for configuring things such as uh, LDAP. Uh, it's still necessary, for example, to be able to uh, SSH in the box, edit some configuration files. Uh, so those are you know, some of the more advanced uh, configuration options. Um, but uh, we can also follow up offline as well if there's some assistance needed around some of that. But our goal is to make those things available as well. It just uh, currently requires a, a little bit more customization. Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, here's a question from Al. The question is, if I run Dremio from a Docker container in a VM instance for AWS querying, is there a maximum, or maybe it was minimum, to the data lake size in S3 that I can query? Uh, so if you're using uh, Docker containers in, in, in the EKS environment or, or any other environments, there's no uh, hard limits in terms of the maximum data volume. Uh, we have many customers working uh, with, with petabyte data sets and, and data sets at, at the many tens or hundreds of, of terabytes. Um, it really depends upon how many uh, execution units you've uh, provisioned and, and the complexity of the, the, the workload. But there's no specific uh, limitations either in the, the Kubernetes deployment options or in the uh, AWS edition uh, uh, option. They are all, especially from a, an execution plane, um, you know, the same code base. Excellent. Um, one, one other thing, I'll, I'll call it a bunch of different questions coming in from the audience. Uh, no surprise around like benchmarks and comparisons. So uh, we're actually, you know, I can I answer this, uh, but I'll just say it verbally too. Uh, working act, we're working actively right now uh, on benchmarks in a number of different areas, uh, and so stay t stay tuned for that. In some cases, you know, these will you know be focused very much on uh, sort of head to head query performance and the associated cost. Other cases, it's more about like just looking at the overall workload cost itself, but less about the performance per se, because it's you know we 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 can't tell necessarily. Um, what a cloud data warehouse, for example, is actually using under, underneath the covers from an infrastructure point of view. Um, so anyway, we look forward to, to sharing more with that um, as we release it. Um, so one of the uh, uh, questions that it comes in here uh, uh, from Manish is, uh, this again for Tom, how do I connect to Redshift? And when connecting to Redshift, is the compute from Redshift or from Dremio? Uh, so, so that's a great question. So th this is the same whether or not using the AWS edition or our Kubernetes deploy options or standalone deploy options, they're all the same. So we offer connectors to uh, uh, data lake storage, such as S3 and ADLS and HDFS, et cetera. Uh, we also offer connectors to relational NoSQL systems, such as Oracle, Redshift, MongoDB, um, and whatnot. Uh, part, when we work with a relational system, uh, we have what we call advanced relational pushdown, where we'll be able to take Dremio queries and try and push as much of that operation down into the source system. Um, so, for example, if you have a, a complex query, or, or particularly, you know, uh, more usually aggreg aggregates or filters, for example, we will optimistically, based upon the statistics of, of the plan, uh, try and perform some of those operations within Redshift. Uh, so, for example, if you were to uh, query Redshift, make a connection to Redshift, 
and then query a Redshift data set, and let's say you had a filter, you know, I only want a date of May 3rd. I will take that date of May 3rd and push it down to Redshift and only let Redshift kind of perform that filter and only pull that data back to Dremio. And that's very useful for high performance interactive queries. Uh, another mode is to use our reflections. And so we um, we have a lot of customers and interest around that as well. Reflections are a form of acceleration within Dremio. You can think of them as pre-extract. So you could, for example, on the same data sets define reflections uh, on top of Redshift data sets and Dremio will automatically for you uh, uh, pre-pull uh, data from the Redshift system, store it within uh, Dremio. And then during queries, we will optimistically uh, uh, try and use those reflections. And that can be used as a manner to offload work uh, from a, a Redshift type system. And so we have a lot of users that you know, are interested in kind of both scenarios. In some cases, it makes sense for Dremio to kind of work with the relational system in a live manner and have the relational system perform a, a lot of the operations and we'll push those operations down into it. And a lot of other situations, it's particularly true with Teradata and some other EDWs, is people want to offload work, in which case Dremio will pre-extract information and then one time and then make that available for thousands and hundreds of thousands of queries without actually having to retouch um, the underlying system all the time. Yeah, that's right. And I think the you know the big picture is that we see this um, uh, this really interesting shift from you know a very data centric uh, sorry a data warehouse centric world to a world where the data lake is really becoming the center. That's where the data is landing. And so, you know, more and more we're seeing folks, they're just they're just putting the data first in their cloud data lake in S3, and, and then they want to work with it from there. And, and so um, in some cases, we're helping people to kind of migrate, you know, workloads kind of, you know, kind of one by one offload, as, as Tom mentioned, um, you know, uh, from their, you know, whether it's Teradata or some other uh, data warehouse. Uh, but a lot of the new stuff is absolutely going uh, just straight into, into the cloud data lake. And, and they're using us just to access it uh, from there. That's where the center of gravity is. Um, so another uh, question that I see here again uh, for you, Tom. Actually, if you, if you wouldn't mind confirming, just to make sure, in the demo that you were showing with the taxis, uh, the taxi data, I, I believe that was a, a large collection of CSV files uh, that you were querying there with uh, with Dremio. Is that correct? Yeah, the, there's two versions of it. One is a large collection of CSV files, and another is a, uh, a an external reflection uh, a version. So we have oh, a couple right. of different okay. examples there. Uh, but yes, that if people have seen our demo before, it, it has a collection of CSV files, and um, that is what we query. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so here here's a question from uh, I'm I'm sure I'm gonna uh, not, not say your name exactly. I'll just say Ander. Um, so Andrew's question, I think when he was looking, when you were doing the demo, Tom, was when we are not querying data in this example, are the nodes of EC2 stopped or are they consuming resources and cost? So that's a great uh, a question. Um, when the project is created by default, we, create, uh, we set up that default engine with auto start and stop. And so when we first started up that project, the executors actually um, were not running and the, we were only running one instance or one EC2 instance, which was a coordinator node. If you happen to notice, I, I uh, pretty quickly in the beginning, I went to look at the taxi data set and I clicked run. When I clicked run, that submitted a query to Dremio. At that point, the engine was stopped, um, but because a query came in, Dremio would automatically start the engine because we had configured Dremio for auto start. Uh, if you then uh, notice as part of the, the, the workflow is we went to the engines page and we saw that the, uh, no, the engine was starting up, uh, one of the nodes was in a, uh, a pending state because we're requesting an instance from Amazon, and another was in a provisioning state, or because we were, or uh, because we were starting up the software. Uh, we then looked at a, a couple other things in the node activity page, and then went back to the engine page, and the engine had started. So it took about 40 seconds for that engine to start from the time I, I clicked that run button. Um, be, that engine was also configured to automatically stop after several minutes. I think it's five by default. Um, again, these are configurable parameters as well. Uh, so that execution unit, those execution nodes did not start immediately, but they did start when I ran a query. And if we ran a longer demo, you would have seen that the engine, the resources would have actually been deprovisioned. We would have deleted those AWS instances uh, after not running more queries for a period of time. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Uh, a couple questions on caching. So uh, I think both Hamid and Sudhir asked sort of similar question, uh, basically around how, how does uh, caching work, particularly C3, I believe. 
So, you know, one, one way that I'll ask here is when you start Dremio, uh, when do you populate the C3 cache and how long do you keep that data in the cache? And, you know, and how, how does the engines affect the cache? Sure. So that, that's a great question. Um, so C3 is a dynamic cache that uses the local ephemeral uh, resources of a server um, in order to, you know, save interesting pieces of data uh, local to the execution unit. Uh, it utilizes for performance reasons, obviously, <clears throat> local uh, SSDs, and it's been heavily optimized for, for NVMe SSDs, which are available uh, in pretty much all uh, uh, cloud server environments. Uh, because of uh, their ephemeral resources, when you stop engines, the cache is actually deprovisioned, and when you start engines, it's now uh, you're essentially going to refresh the cache. Um, this is actually a big um, a benefit over uh, Kubernetes, where in Kubernetes environments, it's not always possible, or sometimes it's more complicated to, to set up the local ephemeral resources because everything the Kubernetes environment wants things as stateful sets. Uh, but we've uh, you know made sure in AWS edition that we're using instances with local SSDs, and we'll utilize those uh, SSDs for caching. So it's automatically configured. Uh, when an engine starts, it will rewarm the cache, uh, but the, the data is persisted within the uh, EC2 instances itself. Excellent. Okay, I think we maybe have time for two more questions. We're not gonna get through them all. There's uh, there's plenty, uh, but we'll, we'll definitely follow up uh, with ones we can't get to, but here in the, in the last couple minutes, does Dremio allow for compression to parquet for any AWS CSV data sets on S3? Uh, so uh, Parquet automatically compresses data. So uh, if there's a, a, a specific technical question there, let, let's take that afterwards. But um, uh, Parquet is a compressed format. And the last one, uh, de definitely an interest on you know saving money, right? Uh, from, based on this question, here we go. Is there a plan support to use spot instances for nodes? I'm curious on this one too. Uh, so so that, that's a great question. And, and we're currently trying to work with Amazon on, on how to best do that. Um, you know, some of the challenges are if your your uh, requested price is below, uh, you know, certain levels, we may not be able to start, or there things may be deep, 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 be deep provisioned by Amazon. Uh, Amazon also has offered flexible pricing for and, and saving plans on reserved instances that actually enable a very similar uh, uh, pricing structure uh, compared to spot instances. Uh, they offer, uh, you know, with the flexible pricing plans that uh, AWS has, has offered. It's not necessarily it's not necessary anymore to use spot instances in order to get the same cost savings. Uh, so that's definitely that that's been the pattern that most of our, our customers and users are, are looking at, which is uh, essentially utilizing the new pricing options that Amazon has offered for reserve instances to get a similar level of cost savings. Um, so that's kind of the focus uh, for right now, but we're continuing to look at at, at spot as well. Great, thank you. And we're at the top of the hour. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, your participation and your questions. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you guys.